Hi everyone, uh, I hope that you can hear me okay. Uh, we're gonna get going today. Uh, as far as I can tell, uh, Discord is having a crappy day. Uh, it's call it an E-class level day. Uh, and uh, uh, we'll take questions on um, uh, Zoom today. So pop them in there if you got them. Otherwise, let's uh, get right into it here. Um, just to get started, oh, it worked. Some logistical points, uh, as you may have realized. Uh, the homework three is due on Friday. Um, yeah, there's no homework posted yet. Uh, I'll put up homework for this weekend, uh, but there's a midterm on next Friday. I told you about that on Monday. Go check out the video if you want to hear more about it. There's no uh, homework on the weeks of midterms. Uh, the midterm is 15 multiple choice questions and two short response. It'll take 45 minutes, uh, plus some time for uploading and stuff like that. And it'll be run over E-class. Uh, the cutoff on material I think we'll do as today. Uh, so this is the last stuff that'll be on there. And then uh, I think uh, I have a tangled uh, office hours schedule because I post uh, the version of E-Class doesn't have my right office hours in it. I'm trying to run office hours on Thursdays from town till noon, uh, but there are some evening times on the syllabus. If you need an evening time chat, uh, send me a message or DM me. I'll try to accommodate it. Um, otherwise, I might be, you know, trying to keep the house from burning down and, you know, various grown-up things. Uh, so happy to try to accommodate, but I can't co reliably commit to Thursday evenings because of uh, arson and other problems. Uh, okay. Um, are there any questions on the sort of, you know, nuts and bolts of the class before we head all the way into uh, things exploding? All right, uh, shout them out if you got them. Otherwise, let's go back and talk about supernova explosions. I think I started this, I went really quickly through it at the end, uh, but for uh, our purposes, a supernova explosion is an explosion with an energetic magnitude of 10 to the 44 joules. Something stellar goes off and it releases about 10 to the 44 joules of energy. And there are two channels for supernova explosions. Uh, we talked about the core collapse supernova, uh, which is the end of a high mass star's life, uh, where the core collapse uh, happens and uh, forms a neutron star. Uh, the neutronization unleashes a wave of neutrinos uh, that blows off the outer layers of the star. Uh, out into space with a characteristic energy of about 10 to the 44 joules. Uh, there's this kind of hierarchy of energy scales with core collapse supernova, where 10 to the 44 is the mechanical energy in the supernova. About 1% of that comes out as light, so it's the photons. Uh, and then about 100 times as much of that comes out in the mass energy of neutrinos. So 10 to the 46 joules comes out in neutrinos. Uh, the sort of thing we care about for galaxy evolution is what gets shot into the galaxy. That's 10 to the 44 joules, which is a lot. Um, and then the energy we see is at 1% of that. So there's kind of a factor of 100 in this energy ladder. And then we'll also later talk about thermonuclear explosions, which is when two white dwarfs end up colliding. Kind of, we talked about kilonova, which are smaller energy scales than these supernova, uh, which were in neutron stars collide. But when white dwarfs collide, they undergo a runaway thermonuclear fusion of their carbon and oxygen up into the iron peak elements like uh, uh, iron, silicon, etc. stuff around the peak of that binding energy per nucleon curve. And this is pretty interesting because this is kind of two ways of injecting enriched matter into the uh, galaxy as a whole. Core collapse supernova tend to put out lighter elements, your carbons, your oxygens, and your nitrogens, uh, and your neons and stuff. Those get put out, and then the thermonuclear supernova enrich the cosmos with the iron peak elements. And then, of course, the kilonovae take care of, like, the platinum and the iridium and all the really heavy, exotic, weird things. Like, you know, where's your praseodymium come from? Uh, neutron stars. But these are the kind of common elements, uh, common channels for enrichment for um, uh, the, let's call them the ordinary elements, the common elements in the universe. 
Uh, I want to go over this graph here. This is from a uh, annual review article led by Nate Smith, uh, and it sort of illustrates the fates of massive stars, or fates of all stars, technically. And what it's showing you here is a graph of the initial mass of the star. And remember, that's not the final mass. That's what it starts with, not what it goes explodey with. And then the metallicity is on a, so we say, uh, you know, coarse scale. Uh, and the top line up here is about, you know, solar, and this metal-free corresponds to the conditions that you expect in the early universe. And this uh, area is kind of divided up into a huge range of different physics uh, or different physical scenarios here. Uh, but, you know, I just want to interpret it is that first we have this boundary here between low mass stars and high mass stars at nine solar masses. And these low mass stars are the things that go on to form white dwarfs. Anything above that can go ahead and fuse um, the later stages, your carbons, oxygen, and neons, up into heavier elements that will eventually reach an iron peak explosion. Uh, and so that is going to produce supernova for basically anything above uh, this nine solar mass threshold. And they will uh, undergo core collapse uh, pretty much regardless of the metallicity. Uh, they'll co undergo core collapse and they will form a neutron star. Uh, so we get this kind of boundary here, which is this black dashed line of the things up here that form neutron stars. So this is neutron stars, neutron stars, neutron stars. And then things below this kind of black boundary are the things that form black holes. So it's not just a simple mass threshold. It's um, a complicated mass versus metallicity threshold. And then we have something kind of weird down here, which is no black hole pair instability supernova explosion. And this is kind of a weird uh, phenomenon where we have uh, what's, uh, it, you get such high energies inside the star that the individual photons undergo pair production. So they form uh, a, a photon will be coming along and it will split into a positron and an electron. And then it will sort of recombine to form a uh, photon and go on because it's matter, antimatter annihilation. But when it, go, uh, when it goes from this uh, photon into the matter, antimatter pair briefly, it removes pressure support because you have to basically take a lot of momentum out and put it into particle mass. And while it's in this, it takes out the pressure support and this triggers a collapse and this kind of runaway generation of this matter-antimatter uh, mixture, which then recombines and annihilates and blows off this giant wave of radiation. So it's an unstable form of matter at these very high energies, very, uh, very high energies, very high temperatures uh, that leads to this pro uh, production, uh, the pair production supernova. And that can actually destroy a star without leaving behind the black hole. But you'll notice that this only happens down here at very low metallicities because it requires very high mass. Things up here in this section of the diagram start out with very high mass, but as you'll recall, those are the stars that at high metallicity and high mass end up losing like 90, 95% of their mass. So in reality, what's exploding isn't a 100 solar mass star, but something more like a 10 solar mass star. So, you know, you lose 10, 90% of your mass, uh, you end up down here, and this is much more in the, it's acting much more like a neutron star progenitor system uh, and having a regular uh, explosion with these classifications, the SN1B1C, indicating that it's lost a lot of its mass. That's just an observational designator that we won't worry too much uh, about here. And then this line here, these things that are black hole by feedback, weak supernova, what happens here is that the supernova explosions aren't strong enough, uh, uh, basically aren't strong enough to unbind a lot of material, and the material falls back onto this newly formed neutron star and pushes it over its maximum mass, which is at about 2.2 solar masses, and then it collapses down to form a black hole. So you get these regions here which form a a neutron star and undergo an explosion, but then end up collapsing down to form a black hole. So for solar metallicity objects, that's sort of between 25 and 40 solar masses uh, in this regime. But then one of the coolest things that happen, uh, I think happens is that these very high mass 
modest metal SV stars, they just simply run out of support and can undergo direct collapse. No explosion, just star one day, black hole the next, nothing in between. And uh, what, oop, uh, yeah, before I, I'll, I'll we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. I'll just, I'm on a tear here. Uh, there's evidence of this happening. So this is a event that happened in NGC 6946, nearby galaxy, some, I think it's 12 megaparsecs away, and, you know, relatively close galactic neighbor. And uh, they've been observing the star, taking pictures of this galaxy, and there's this big red supergiant star in the system that just one day disappeared. It's gone. There's no sign of a supernova explosion, no remnant. Basically, we would detect it if it were there. And so this is one of those candidates that you just had a star. Next day, no star. Just collapses down straight to black hole uh, collapse. So this is a great candidate for this kind of thing, event happening. Low metallicity, high mass star, and a, a high mass star so that it just undergoes collapse without going through a supernova explosion. All right, um, I'm gonna pause there. I'm gonna ask you an e-poll question and you all can also phrase any questions you have about this whole process. The e-poll question that I had was basically just reading through this diagram to see if you can kind of parse uh, all the gobbledygook that I just talked to, talk through, which of the following stars will not have a black hole as a stellar remnant? All right, let's, uh, yeah. So there was a question in the chat about, you know, would this be a sort of, like these direct black hole collapses, would they be sudden? Yeah, they would. They basically, you'd run out of pressure support. It'd be on the time scale of a supernova, which is real quick. And then it just sort of collapses down to nothing. Uh, what's a uh, pulse pair black hole? I. I don't remember what a pulsation pair black hole is. I should look that up and get back to you. Sorry about that. Uh, I think that's a pair, related to the pair instability, but uh, I can't remember. I'm sorry. I should have looked up every annotation in this plot. Uh, all right. So uh, coming back to the e-poll question. Uh, let's see what we got. We got everybody in here, right? Uh, book. All right, we're like in uh, whatever 100 solar mass solar uh, metallicity is. So this is really just looking at the graphs here. So 30 uh, solar masses, solar metallicity is probably uh, right about there. That's in the black hole regime. 100 solar masses, solar metallicity is right about there. That's clearly out, so we can stop our search there. Uh, but 60 solar masses, low metallicity is, you know, oh, that's in the direct to black hole regime. 100 solar masses, low metallicity, kind of similar affair. And then 60 solar masses, solar metallicity would be 
right about there, also in the black hole. So answer B is looking good for us. Will I give you the questions without a graph as a reference? No, I, my, I'm a big believer of like you have the graph. I mean, the book, the, the, the exam's open book, so you will always have the graph as a reference because the graph is there. Uh, but I think that the important thing that I want is making sure you can interpret existing graphs rather than sort of shoving all of this knowledge into your head. That's why we have the figure, right? Okay, uh, moving on. Uh, so this kind of gives us the geography of what are called stellar remnants. Uh, the stuff that's below uh, nine solar masses, these low and medium solar mass stars, they leave behind carbon and oxygen, neon, white dwarfs. We focused on the generation of carbon, the creation of oxygen and neon sort of come up during the helium fusion process where you just tack an extra helium nucleus onto the carbon or onto the oxygen respectively to get up to these heavy uh, sort of you know, most stable elements. Uh, these are, oops, that should be an electron. It's not positron degeneracy pressure. It's electron degeneracy pressure uh, is their source of pressure support. And they have sort of typical scales about the size of the Earth. They're extremely hot and we can still see them but because of their small luminosities or their small, yeah, their small uh, sizes and high temperatures, their luminosities are fairly low. So we tend to see them in the HR diagram down there at the bottom, uh, uh, sort of at very low luminosities there. Uh, neutron stars happen in this regime uh, here where we have uh, sort of between nine and this kind of 25 solar mass regime here, and then some initial masses up here at very high solar masses. But for most stars in this nine to 25 solar mass uh, regime, uh, you end up creating this neutron star through the process of neutri uh, neutronization. Um, you know, the protons and the electrons end up sort of getting shoved together, forming neutrons, coupling out a burst of neutrinos. Uh, and uh, this gives you behind a neutron star supported by this weird quantum mechanical pressure uh, that's the, you know, comes from trying to pack too many fermions into a tiny place. Uh, this is just the tip of the iceberg for the weird physics of neutron stars. Uh, they get into some very, very strange abstract particle physics to try to come up with what's the behavior of all these particles at very high densities. Uh, but the upshot is that observations and theory both give us the idea that these are you know, about the scale of an Edmonton. Um, so 10 kilometers in radius or 12 kilometers in radius is kind of the characteristic size here. So this is, you know, kind of, a, you know, a completely graspable physical scale for once, but a mind bogglingly huge mass scale here. These all have masses between kind of 1.4 and two solar masses in this tiny scale. Uh, these are fundamentally spooky, terrifying objects. Um, and then we end up with uh, black holes, which ha show up for moderate and low modulicities for anything above, um, oops, I made an error here too, that's uh, 25 solar masses up to about 300. Uh, that gives us our uh, black holes, and they have a characteristic size that's set by the Schwarzschild radius, which is 2gm over c squared. Um, black holes are really pretty fascinating. Uh, the important thing is that this produces black holes with kind of characteristic mass scale up to at most a few hundred solar masses. We will see later on that some of the most important black holes in the context of gal galaxy evolution have scales of 10 to the 5 up to 10 to the 9 solar masses. These are these supermassive black holes in galaxies. And so they have to come from a different channel. And they are also the drivers of active galactic nuclei, which drive these huge jets out uh, from uh, the black holes. The last thing I want to talk about, and by means of background, is this notion of metallicity. We've been sorting, we've been sort of steering around it a bit. We said that okay, we can just treat this as a mass fraction in the context of stellar evolution, but galaxies actually care a bit about the chemistry of a galaxy. Like in the sun, it's really easy because we only have kind of one pattern of elements, and that's shown here. This is the abundances of elements in our solar system, and they are graphed here on a log 
logarithmic scale as a function of atomic number, kind of aggregating all the isotopes of an uh, atom uh, together. And so the way you read this is that uh, hydrogen is the most abundant element in our solar system. You may not appreciate that being on Earth, but you know most of the mass is in the sun, and the sun is mostly hydrogen. This is a graph of the abundance of species by number. So this is counting by particle, by nuclear number, by a number of particles, I should say. We've been dealing with counting these by mass. When you deal with the XYZs, that's stellar evolution, mass functions. But this is actually just numbers of atoms. How many atoms are there of X versus how many atoms there are of Y? A few things to note here. Uh, apart from hydrogen is the most common, helium is the next most common. That's from the Big Bang and Big Bang nucleosynthesis. Then we have this big trough here, or this little trough here, where the lithium, beryllium, and boron are super rare given their low atomic numbers. And that's because of this nuclear process and that binding, the structure of that binding energy nucleon curve. And indeed, this sort of sawtooth pattern of up down, up, down, up, down, up, down. That's all from the stability of nuclei under the process of nuclear fusion. It's much easier to make carbon and oxygen than it is to make nitrogen because uh, the carbon and oxygen nuclei are more stable. And so you end up with, they are more energetically favored under the nuclear fusion process. Uh, fluorine, very rare, and so on. So we read this as a logarithmic scale where this is a log base 10 of the number of particles. So if I want to calculate the ratio of, say, carbon to oxygen, I would look at the uh, difference between them. So uh, say oxygen is here at, say, 7.2, and carbon is here at like 6.8. I would calculate the ratio of carbon over oxygen. Uh, at, whoop, let me write it uh, this way. We write this as n carbon over n oxygen would be 10 to the 6.8 minus 7.2, which is 10 to the minus 0 0.4. And that's about, uh, I think it's about, oh, that ends up being about 0 0.4. I just freewheeled that calculation since I thought it was important to say, so I haven't pre-calculated. Ah, 0 0.4, right on the nose. Man, I'm, I'm feeling mathy today. It's amazing. Okay, good feelings gone. Um, okay, given that, uh, okay, yeah. So I was sort of caching this uh, for later, uh, but this is uh, just a recap that you know, we've previously been dealing with metallicity uh, in terms of mass fraction. So with that big Z there. Uh, the other thing that we'll see a ton in this class as we go forward is this notation. Uh, which is the bracket notation for stellar, uh, for metallicities. And this represents the abundances of one group or element relative to another. And so here, alpha is a funny little way of talking about the alpha process elements. So this is carbon, oxygen, and neon are the alpha group elements. So you sort of aggregate them all together because they're the things that are formed by this alpha fusion process in uh, the late stages of stellar evolution. Uh, and Fe is iron. So we kind of compare this to the stuff at iron. And so when you see this notation of brackets, that's the difference in logs. So it's really uh, sort of the ratio of the logs. And that's comparing it and this is the weird part, comparing it to the same value established for the solar system. So that thing. And so when we see this, most of these brackets are anchored as zero means solar-like, negative means smaller than the suns, and positive means larger than the suns. Finally, we will occasionally deal with what's just straight up metallicity by number. And for reasons of not liking negative numbers, having a strong anti-negative bias, we usually add 12 to this number. So you'll often see metallicity is expressed as 12 log O on H, which really just means 12 log N O over N H. All right, 
that's, uh, I hope the last of the sort of like gibberish I'm just going to throw straight at you and now we can start all putting it together. But uh, let's take a pause and I'll ask you just to sort of do some interpretation. What is 12 plus log O on H for the solar system, given the graph we've laid out here? All right, we're getting a lot of convergence. Let's see how we do. Okay, so to estimate these properties, we reach read across uh, just the values here. And I'll guess that uh, H is at about 10.4 on this scale and oxygen's at about 7.2. And so when we do uh, 12 plus log on O on H, 12 plus log from the rules of logs, ratios, are just uh, differences, minus 12 log h. It's kind of how you would interpret that. So this is just 12 plus 7.2 minus 10.4. And if I twiddle that out, I get 8.8. .8. So on this scale, solar, solar oxygen abundance is 8.8. Is .8. Uh, so that's how we would see that. And so you'll often see like, oh, here at 12 plus log O on H of 8.2, you're like, oh, that means that means subsolar oxygen abundance. Okay, makes sense. All right. So the reason why we care about, well, uh, let's see how we do. Let's close off the e How did we do, friends? <gasps> okay, okay. I got, I got, I definitely got some numbers. I got 11.8. I guess. How would that happen? Maybe if you switch the 10.4 and the 7.2, you'd get 11.8. Lots of 11.8s, but uh, also lots of 8.8s. So feeling good about that. Uh, any questions on how that went? I choose to interpret that as I had a very lucid explanation. Um, it's probably not the right reason, but yeah, we'll go with it. Okay, uh, so I just want to say with metallicity, we care about this because stars produce metals and therefore metallicity is the signature of stellar evolution. Uh, it gives us some sense as to what happened in the past in the galaxy, which is why I'm kind of dragging in these crazy astronomical conventions, is we can start to read in them and start to see what happened here. Um, you know, just as a, just as a cool aside, uh, we uh, here in our solar system have a surprisingly large amount of a radioactive aluminum isotope. Uh, and it is embedded in such a way that we think that our solar system was actually formed near a, um, it, it, our solar system was actually formed near a supernova in a cluster environment. And so that's the kind of signature uh, that, uh, yeah. Yeah, so that's the kind of signature that you expect. Here. Okay, ah, I see the explanation there, got it.
uh, where the 11 point whatever comes from. Okay, so that's the kind of process that you can go through here. So thanks all uh, for clarifying. Okay, so we're going to change gears now and talk about kind of what's in the next chapter. I've written a good chunk of it. I hope to, I really want to get it up uh, soon, but I stopped to actually get, you know, get the lecture slides uh, put together. I'm sorry that the book is not caught up yet. Uh, I'll have it up uh, by the end of today. Doesn't much matter. Uh, but since you won't need it for homework or midterm prep or Friday, but um, I do still feel guilty. Uh, regardless, our next plan is to go through and try to take everything that we've put together so far, our observational conventions and our knowledge of stars to start to understand this process called star stellar populations. And ultimately we want to explain the features that we observe in two cases. The first we've been staring at a lot. Here's our Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. These are the nearest stars to us, and we've basically plotted everything. It just goes on here, and the only thing that's in here are high quality parallax measurements and low extinction, and these are the stars that we see around us. But you'll sort of notice that there's, this is plotting not just where the stars are, that's what we've been focusing on, but it's plotting the density of stars. How many stars are there? And there are lots of stars right here in the FG regime. And well, where does that come from? And there's almost nothing up here in the O and B regime. What happened to all the O and B stars? Why are we even talking about them? Uh, what's going on there? Why is this thick? Why is the main sequence thick? If we look at clusters, it's that razor thin main sequence. Where does that extra width come from? Why are the white dwarfs also a thick sequence? What's the red clump as distinct from these AGB stars? Why is there some spread there? What's this stuff in the middle here? That shouldn't be there according to a lot of HR diagrams. Yeah, what's going on with hot subdwarfs? What's this crap? I mean, that's the kind of stuff that we need to understand with stellar populations and try to figure out where does this thing get its shape given what we know about stars? But there's something we haven't really talked about, and that's if we look farther afield. When we start to study other galaxies, we can't see the contents of the individual stars there. This is, it's, this is just an unresolved mess. We aren't picking out nearest stars. This is only in our solar neighborhood that we can do this Gaia stuff. This stuff is all away, and when we're looking out there, we're seeing millions hundreds of millions of stars along a given sort of part of the image. And what we do there is we measure the observed light coming out. Uh, so these are data from a survey team that I'm on. Uh, we, and if we look at this galaxy here, uh, this is 3627, um, NGC 3627, and we look at the center here, we can actually make the flux density distribution, uh, map of the flux density distribution, also known as a spectra. Uh, and this is the resulting spectrum over this section of the wavelength. That says air wavelength in nanometers. And what we do is we see little stellar absorption feature lines here. We see all of these uh, like lines. And a lot of this stuff, this sort of janky up and down stuff, that's not, uh, that's not crap in the spectrum. That's stellar lines, in the, like from mil, you know millions of stars in the line of sight, all with different temperatures and metallicities and stuff. So we want to be able to sort of figure out how does the emergent light from galaxies uh, come about? And that's also a study of stellar populations. Given what we know, to make these predictions, we'd kind of need four main ingredients to really understand all of these pieces. The first thing, and probably the hardest thing, is the star formation history, which is basically, if we're looking around us, what mass of stars formed over the course of time? Was it 10 solar masses a year for a billion years? Was it 100 billion solar masses or 10 billion solar masses over one year? How did like the stars actually form? And this is actually has to do with galaxy evolution. How are galaxies making stars? So in this process of studying stellar uh, populations, this is probably the thing we want to leave as the output. Our inputs are a little better understood. Uh, the first thing is we need the initial mass function, which is if I turn some mass into stars, uh, 
what's the probability density function of stellar masses that results? The initial masses. And, and can I understand how that probability density function varies as a function of galactic properties, like where it is in the universe, how old is it, what part of the galaxy is? Does that affect the initial mass function? The next thing we want to do is understand the metallicity of the stars that form. So we make stars, uh, they are all minted with a certain chemical signature, which they then carry with them through their lives. But that chemistry is important. We've banked a big deal out of low versus high metallicity stars and how they evolve differently. So we've got to know a bit about the metallicity. And then those stars die and return their metallicity to their environment. So we have to understand a bit about how the stars enrich, is the word we use, uh, their environment. And finally, as kind of an asterisk, we also need to understand companion frequency. What fraction of stars form in binaries uh, or multiple star systems and uh, with other stars or brown dwarfs as the part of this star formation process. And so you notice I've been talking a lot about the process of star formation because once we form stars, they kind of evolve without interacting much with each other. So we really need to sort of focus on this part of the stellar populations in terms of the star formation process. So let's take a closer look at that. And the first thing we would like to know is what's the characteristic mass of stars that form? And to that end, we need to understand where stars form. Uh, fortunately, we can go and look for that. And this is a picture of a star forming region. Uh, it's a picture in the optical. Uh, this is towards the Perseus molecular clouds, which is uh, near Taurus on the sky. It's kind of a not very flashy constellation, so it's hard to kind of pick out. Uh, but if you use a really amazing uh, sort of astrophotography setup that these uh, uh, astronomers put together, you get this beautiful look at space, and you can see that there are young stars forming. How do we know they're young? Well, they're massive and they haven't lost a lot of their mass. Uh, so we know that they must be fairly young because if they can't be old, because they would have died already. So these are the young stars. And in fact, further study identifies this as regions hosting protostars. So things that are in that sort of section of the hertzsprung russell diagram collapsing down onto the main sequence. So these regions are star-forming regions. And when we look at it, you're like, look at all this crap that's in the way. What's all this smudgy bits? Well, that's the dust that I was talking about in the context of, the, of Gaia evolution or the Gaia exercise. And that's all integrated and mixed in with the gas in this environment. And so we can use that to actually see where the star forming gas is. And so we study that in the context here of thermal emission from the dust grains. This is observed in the infrared. And we see that there's this wispy kind of star forming filamentary structure here. And then we can do a lot of studies that I can tell you more than you really want to know about. Uh, that infer that these gas clouds have kind of a typical tem uh, density of about 10 to the 8th hydrogen molecules per cubic meter, and that's kind of our common way of measuring this, and a temperature of about 10 Kelvin, which is really, really quite cold. And the reason why they form here has to do with the star formation process itself. And that gets back to this question of what's the characteristic mass of stars that form? And that comes back to the dominant forces, the dominant physics of stellar evolution. Pressure versus gravitational collapse, except to form a star, gravitational collapse has to win. It has to collapse down and heat up to a point where nuclear fusion ignites in its core. So that means we want gravity to win uh, to form the stars. And so what we do is we envision a medium that has a uniform mass density. I was quoting a number density earlier, but this is just mass density, rho, kilograms per cubic meter, tiny number of kilograms per cubic meter. And you can say that in that medium, you can basically ask how big, uh, you know, if I make a spherical cloud out of that medium and just turn it loose without pressure support, how long will it take to collapse? And without wanting to belabor the derivation, you can find out that irrespective of the radius of the cloud, it will always collapse down to a point 
in what's called a free fall time. Other physics will kick in before then, but for here, the free fall time is given by this expression, three pi over 32 g rho. So if I give you, you know, the only thing you need to know here is rho. And so if I give you a mass density, you can calculate a free fall time. So if I give you a mass density, you calculate a free fall time. I will, in case you don't have this in the back of your head, tell you that g is 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 meter cubed per kilogram second squared. And what I'd like to know is what's the free fall gas uh, collapse time for a gas cloud with a density of 10 to the minus 18 kilograms per meter cubed. All right, let's see how we did. So we take a free fall time. Oops, that's an eraser. Let's not do that. Uh, free fall time is uh, 3 pi, uh, 32 times 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 meter cubed per kilogram second squared times the mass density I've just given you this 10 to the minus 18 kilograms per meter cubed, all raised to the one half power. And I can stick that in and I get that that's 6.64 times 10 to the uh, 13 seconds, which you can then do the obvious divide by 60, divide by 60, divide by 24. But something that I have stuck in my head is that uh, one year, is very close to pi times 10 to the seven seconds. So pi seconds is a nano century. Uh, so uh, grinding that all out, I get an answer that's about 2.1 mega years. So uh, yeah, that's uh, how did uh, we agree? Oh, yeah, we agree. We very much agree. Excellent. Uh, okay, so I'm going to skip over this because I want to sign a finish a punchline today. Uh, I'll come back and do that later. Um, so what's neat about this is that if we know the free fall time, we can relate the free fall time, which is how long it takes for gravity to act, to how long it takes for pressure to act. So if we're going to collapse something down, its pressure is going to increase. And so what gravity does is it kind of happens too fast for the pressure to resist it. And so 
when pressure is trying to exert its force on an object, it does so on the sound crossing time. So it's how long does it take for a pressure wave to traverse an object? And so if we happen collapse faster than pressure can get across the object, then we're going to have something that can do undergo a runaway collapse. So the sound crossing time for an object, and I'm sort of illustrated here, that's at this kind of critical scale for collapse where gravity is at large enough scale that can pull all its mass together before pressure can say, stop, stop collapsing. That's going to be uh, this relationship between the sound crossing time and the free fall crossing time. So if I set those two equal, I can derive this critical length scale that sort of separates larger scales where pressure will get across it and smaller scales where gravitational collapse will occur. So if I solve that, I can uh, get this scale and we call it lambda sub j, which is called the critical length scale for the genes instability named after an inst uh, a, a physicist whose name is genes. There's no apostrophe. The full name has an S. It's just the genes instability. Uh, and we can then take that characteristic scale for collapse and set that as uh, mass density times basically the cube of length to get out the volume. And if we do that correctly, I'm just saying that this coefficient is hard to get, the scalings we can derive pretty easily. Uh, but the scalings that we get is that the genes mass is about pi to the three halves. That comes from far more complicated math than we want to do here. Over eight times cs cubed uh, g to the three halves rho to the half. And what I can do is basically non-dimensionalize that, stick in characteristic values for a uh, cloud and come up with that that's about seven solar masses times the temperature of a cloud times the density to the one uh, to the three halves, density to the one half. And so what this gives me is a sense that the lower the uh, temperature scale, the closer we get to kind of typical stellar masses here. And when we have things happening in these uh, cold clouds, we end up fragmenting down into stellar scale objects. So that's where uh, this is one of the reasons. It, star formation kind of happens in cold gas because that's the place where the pressure forces are weak enough that they can resist the gravitational collapse. So the last thing I wanted to do was to show you, uh, not this, but uh, something else, which is movies. This is a simulation of the star formation process. So this takes all of the physics of star formation and tries to do it right. We try to do it crappy and fast. These people are doing it right numerically. And so this is simulated on a uh, high performance computer system uh, in the US uh, uh, with this team that's called the Starforge simulation. So if you like their stuff, go check out starforge.space uh, and uh, on as that's their URL. And so what we're seeing is that this cloud is actually this big turbulent mass of gas that's collapsing. We're kind of zooming through this three-dimensional rendering, uh, simulating this uh, physics carrying out. And what you can see here is that there's these little, these sort of white points here are the collapses down to form individual stars. And what you can start to see now is that as that material is accreting onto the stars and building up their masses, they start uh, to shoot out these little jets. You can see them sort of spit out. There's some ones in the top right there. These protostellar jets are a consequence of having to shed angular momentum with accreting material. So it's sort of falling in here and forming, uh, forming these stars. And so it's kind of this big fire hose of material that's going wonkily off into the, star, into the cloud and it's stirring it up and making a big mess. And you can see these shells expanding around it as nuclear fusion is turning on in these stars and radiating away and destroying their local clouds. So this process of physics is basically, you start out with, oh, spherical cloud collapsing, a little bit of turbulence because it's supersonic motions, because it's so cold. And 
This turns into a real train wreck of physics. So star formation is this gloriously messy process that uh, it starts to you know give rise to these you know populations of stars, and they all sort of form down here at the center of this cloud in clusters. And this only takes a few mega years to play out. This is relatively fast. We can't observe it, of course, but it's relatively fast. And so this star formation simulation is carrying out all of that on a human legible time scale, and we start to see how this is all uh, proceeding. And the crazy thing about this is that for all this kind of train wreck of physics, we seem to almost always get out the same pattern of stellar masses called the initial mass function. So the next time we go through this, we're going, uh, next time we meet, uh, I guess the following Monday, we'll be going over how to use this truism of stellar physics to really understand stellar populations as a whole. So check out starforge.space if you want to watch more cool movies uh, or stare at this one again. And otherwise, I'll see you on Friday when you have done your Gaia reading. Have a good day. Thank you.